Hello everyone. So today we are here with Sylvia Duckworth, who is currently in Florida or Toronto? No, Toronto right now. Toronto, and I'm yeah. here in uh, India. And today we are going to share a little bit about our way of teaching foreign languages. Everything is going to be in English, but we are both French teachers. So uh, Sylvia is going to talk about the AIM approach, the AIM method that she uses in her classroom. And then I'll be talking about the silent way approach. And we're going to exchange ideas and discuss how we integrate technology into the second language classroom. So it's you, um, your turn now. You can go ahead, Sylvia, and start uh, with your slides. OK, I'm going to screen share. So let me just get this on. And hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, Fanny, can you see my screen? Yes, um, perfect. OK, perfect. All right, so I teach French. I teach core French in Canada. And in Canada, we have different French programs, French second language programs. So core French is when the students see the teacher anywhere from 20 minutes to 40 minutes a day. I see my students 40 minutes a day. And I teach boys only. I teach um, at an independent school. And I teach French to grades three and four. So we're talking about boys who are eight and nine years old. And it's their first exposure to French for most of them. Uh, but the other types of programs we have in Canada are French immersion programs, which means that students are fully immersed in French for the first few years of school. However, I teach core French, so their exposure to French is quite limited. Um, I've been using AIM for about 17 years now, and I've been teaching French for a very long time. I've been teaching for more than 30 years, and this method came along, and I went, wow, this is really something. I noticed the fluency levels of my students increasing almost immediately and their interest and engagement in French class went up as well. But there's a link to my presentation. Um, so the bit.ly link is there. Uh, so bit.ly slash FSL tech sill and do pay attention to the um, uppercase lowercase when you're typing that in. The next slide just shows you different ways that you can get in touch with me um, on social media and email. And I have a blog in the bottom right hand corner with all of my resources are there. I have lots of resources there for you to take a look at. I would like to play this video. It's only three minutes long. And it really kind of, I want to play because it shows what AIM is about. It's very active. The boys are very engaged. We have a lot of fun. And the video also talks a bit about how I use technology in class. And this was a video created by an organization, um, the Ontario, uh, I forget the exact name, I'm sorry. Um, but they wanted to profile me. I won a teaching award a couple years ago. And so they wanted to profile me with this, um, with this video. So we're just going to play it. And I hope that you can see it OK. If, if the, quality isn't that good, um, you can actually go right to my website, sylviaduckworth.com, and click on media, and you'll find the video there as well. I was feeling very frustrated that we weren't developing any level of fluency. clothing and colors. And so I adopted AIM in a program that teaches French in a way you can actually AIM is use of vocabulary with gestures, doing it in a literacy based approach, story context. The more they speak, the better they speak. 
have. And that's one of the things that hadn't happened before, can, sorry. is that it would be one-on-one. -on -one. But when you're using the hand gestures, every single child is able to speak along with you all the time. My goal eventually is to stop talking altogether, answers, and just gesturing. And then they're saying exactly what I'm saying with gestures, and they're speaking along. And this is almost like a back in the choir. They're loud, um, but not a bad loud. <laughs> there's, you know, there's a good loud and there's a bad loud. Because they're enthusiastic. They love participating. If they all are speaking together, it's fantastic. Because that means that they're all practicing the language. What Sylvia is doing is not only just teaching the language, but also teaching technology. It's different. Unique. Better because we get like, we learn about technology and French at the same time. So, yeah. Madame Beckwith teaches them in a way that actually lets them create their learning material and participate in it rather than just be consuming it. I think what an amazing way to teach children and how fun. Once we did this FaceTime with another class in Sacramento, California. And we refused to find out where they were. And we, we, we like practice our French skills with people we never met before. It's good talking with other people and we don't <coughs> because they can get out of the back seat. All right, there's a good teacher and there's a great teacher. And that great teacher never stops working. To me, there's nothing more gratifying to have a class in a really loud voice speaking in French. It has to be in French. He's speaking loudly in English, but it's working. But this program really encourages that. And they do love it. Learn more at OCT.ca. Okay, so that's a little bit about AIM. Um, but there is a website, aimlanguagelearning.com, so I do encourage you to, to check that out. If you go onto the site, you'll see all their resources as well as opportunities for professional development. They have lots of workshops, and there's an annual summer institute east, and there's one out west as well, which is a lot of fun. Um, so check that out if you're interested. But uh, a little bit more about AIM. It was created by a Canadian teacher, Wendy Maxwell, um, who lives in Vancouver. The program uses gestures, songs, stories, and plays to, con to contextualize the language being taught. And Wendy created gestures for all the high-frequency words used in French. So this covers even irregular verbs, which are not normally taught at, in a beginner French program. So in a traditional program, you're teaching ER verbs first, and then you move on to uh, maybe avoir and être, and then you move on to IR verbs and RE verbs. Well, this is not the way AIM works. So you use, uh, right away, you teach verbs like the, doi, pe, se, all these irregular verbs that the students need to know how to, how to use before they can actually have a conversation in French. And Wendy analyzed the French language and came up with her own list of the most frequently used words, and she created gestures for almost all of them. There are, gosh, I think there's about 1,500 gestures now, but initially um, you focus on teaching about 750 gestures for the first year of AIM. Um, AIM has a very strong oral component at first, but eventually there is a written component as well. I'm sorry, my lights just went off. I just have to move around in my classroom. Um, and uh, students have an opportunity to, with the written component, they answer questions that are based on the story or on the play that we learned uh, in class. But they also have an opportunity for their own creative writing with this program. If you want to see my classroom in action, a few years ago, I developed a blog, sylviaduckworth.blogspot.com, and I videotaped a grade three entry level class. My school starts in grade three, and so this is the first year of French for most of them. Um, and you can see right from the very beginning, from the very first day, how AIM works. So we start off with an entry routine, and then we move on to, to other lessons. Um, and the rest of the presentation I'm going to show you after Fanny talks about um, 
the silent method, but uh, most of the projects that we do in French class now are based on the stories and the plays that they learned with the AIM program. So I'll talk about that later. So that is a very quick over overview of AIM. And I think, I think that's all I want to say at this point, Fanny. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I'm already like taking notes of things that we could discuss. <laughs> um, okay. I'm going to share my screen. And this is what happened when you share. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes. What a beautiful slideshow. Where did you get that background? <laughs> Same uh, as you, I think, the slides carnival. Wow, that's fantastic. I was just I was just so jealous when I saw your slides and I changed mine right away. <laughs> wow, you work quickly. <laughs> it's beautiful. <laughs> So um, yeah, I'm going to talk now about the silent way approach, um, and mainly what's important to talk about in this is the subordination of teaching to learning. So, uh, so my name is Fanny Passport, and I'm an ed tech coach at Mercedes-Benz International School in Pune, which is in India. It's uh, 9:30 right now in India in the evening, and I'm home. So welcome. You can find me at Fanny underscore Passport on Twitter. And I'm going to uh, give you a quick overview of really the main pedagogical component of the silent way. So um, this is the person who created or invented the, the approach. His name is Caleb Gattegno. So he passed away in 88. And I've been following uh, a few trainings from um, people who learned directly from him. And what is really important in the silent way is that the silence is for the teacher, not for the students, obviously. And the silence is really a pedagogical device. It's really a way for the teacher to focus on the learning of the students. So some of the sketches I made recently, just to show that idea that if we speak less as teachers, then there is more opportunities for students to speak. And also something really important in the silent way is really believing that learning is a creative process. It's not something that we try to get in the student's head. It's rather something that we want to, uh, which one we want to come out of the student. Okay. Uh, another thing which is really important is that Gatenio, who created the silent way. Uh, did a lot of research and actually he looked a lot at how babies learn their mother tongue and he observed something uh, really important is that we cannot control our uh, hearing but we can control our phonation system. So this is something really important about how we learn our mother tongue. We tend to think that we just imitate what uh, others do what our caregivers do but we actually uh, during the babbling process we do a lot of things by ourselves. Indeed, we do everything. All the first speech sounds that we are going to make are entirely because we are exploring what's happening with our phonation system. So uh, it's a long theory, but I would like just for you to focus on this because it will help you understand why the teacher is not uh, providing a model. OK, so uh, for instance, here, this is what uh, this comes from uh, Pierce Besson. He has a really great article here, which you can check. Um, this first model is what people believe most of the time is the um, imitation system that the caregiver says something and then the baby hears and then he's going to try and repeat. And this other model, which is uh, most probably what Gatenio, he didn't really uh, explain it in length, but then other people after him uh, explain that, uh, and Pierce Mason, for example, is the mirroring process. So most of that here you see is the baby starting to speak and not the mother. So the baby speaks and then the mother is like, oh, this, this seems to be like this word in my L1, in my language. So I'm going to repeat it with in a perfect way. So if the baby is trying to say, um, mama, something like that, she's going to repeat it in a very well-pronounced way. For example, mama. 
and this is uh, this is a mirroring process. So this is just to show that actually the baby does all the work, <laughs> and the the parents are the one who most of the time uh, imitate rather than the baby. Anyway, I want to go to the next level, but I just wanted to give you this uh, first introduction. But I I want to go to the teaching now. So uh, one of the very important thing in the silent way is the stages of learning. So first thing is that we should be aware as learners that there is something to learn. Because if we don't know there is something to learn, we are not going to be able to learn it. The second step is that we are going to explore by trial and error. But trial and error also with a feedback. Because without feedback, we don't know what we need to change. What we need to change and what, how we should iterate. So we should be really present to what we are doing. And we receive feedback, or we can also create our own uh, uh, way of uh, correcting ourselves, and we will be able to improve. The third step is continuing this process of trial and error, but with total presence of what we're doing. So we are automatizing what we're learning. And finally, we've got that knowledge, that piece of knowledge. We are really. Um, we, are, we automatized it and we can now transfer it to something else. So sometimes we believe that people are talented with something, but this is because they can transfer previous learning to something else. Uh, some of the tools and some of the tools that we use and strategies. So first of all, uh, there is a series of tools that we can use, but they are not uh, necessary. If we want, we can teach without them. So here is um, all these colors represents a sound of the language. So for example, this red here is E and the white here is A. Ah. So these are the vowel sounds and then the consonant sound. And there's a color to represent them so that uh, we are going to play a game with the students. So the teacher is going to point with an actual pointer on one sound and going to mimic uh, a sound, for example, here. E and the students are going to find. So this is an exploration game, especially good with beginners when they start to learn, but also for uh, phonetic corrections later on. So then we start like playing with words and getting this phonological awareness and then moving to syllables and then moving to words and sentences, etc. So uh, this is just the key to show you how uh, these are all the sounds, all the phonemes. And then there are like, uh, a lot of charts over here with really important words of the language. So here, those are the charts for French. And um, as you can see, the words are colored with the sound and color system previously learned. So that it's really easy for anyone to read French, a language like French, which is not phonetic, pretty easily once you know the colors. So you can, instead of looking at the letters, you really focus on how is this going to be pronounced. So it's really useful for French and for English. Uh, maybe it's easier for Spanish because Spanish is very phonetic language. So this is how it works. And then again, the teacher is going to show different situations, most of the time uh, using rods. So we have uh, colored, coded rods, and we create situations so those things can be uh, characters or this can be uh, to create a map on the table or to create um, a house or something or even a story and then you have this tool over here which is the fidel and you have all the possible spellings for each sound of the language so for example here in white all these are the spelling for the same sound ah so it's giving you an exhaustive view of how you can spell words in french and once again it involves uh, and pointing at words and making like making your own spelling of any word you want in the language. So this is how it works in the reality. So those are students, they are working on those uh, words in colors. Uh, here, this, are, this is a student working here on a situation and here's another student working on another temporal and physical activity about temporality. So we try to make them really experience the meaning and giving them feedback. So the, over here, for example, uh, I'm correcting, I'm, I'm putting a word on each of my finger and then I'm helping her to correct something. So for example, that can be the order so I can then switch my fingers and uh, 
to help her understand what she should change, but I'm not telling her what to what to change. So some of the, the strategies that we use, uh, these are all for feedback. Uh, these are some of the other situation or other gestures that you can see in the classroom. So here, for example, I'm giving a feedback on how the students should pronounce the sound, uh, but I'm not saying it. And here the students are working together. We are talking, etc. cetera. Uh, some more class situation. So as you can see, the teacher can be really directive, but it's not through talking. It's really through trying to get the best feedback for the students at that time, here and now, exactly when they need it. And there's a lot of collaboration with students uh, coming to point at words or at sounds and helping one another. Uh, another thing which is really important in the silent way is the focus on quality and not quantity. So sometimes it seems like the class is going slowly, but because there is someone who is stuck with something, so uh, we prefer to spend some time and work on how to help that person uh, correct the problem rather than going too fast and doing more quantity things. Uh, the pedagogical takeaways from me, the first thing is I really love to see that the students they don't need to compare themselves to the teacher and they really take ownership and they really feel proud of themselves because they can do it. So it would be easy, of course, for me to tell them, or for example, if they already have the sound in their language, it would be easy for me to tell them, but it's just so beautiful when they can do it by themselves and they can feel really proud of it. Uh, there is a positive role of the error. So it's like a gift to the class, like that the new set. So we even sometimes ask them to make mistakes so that we can work on what is uh, correct or incorrect in the grammatical structure. And we get a continuous feedback, so they're not alone. We use a lot of visible and tangible learning uh, situations. So uh, they also move around a lot. So I like that in the AIM approach is that it's like they move around. It's all about the student's voice. And we also use a code here to uh, learn the language. And we really focus on multimodality, not just one thing, not just visual or not just tangible, but everything, kinesthetic and uh, so many other aspects. And I feel it's efficient. So I also like that it uh, really encourages autonomy and collaboration, presence of students towards what they are doing, so presence to themselves in their, in, them as learners and they are more motivated and then for the teacher's point of view you really need to introspect and find out about your own language or the language you're teaching and reflect on how you can best help the students so one of the things that silent we teachers do a lot is instead of preparing instead of spending a lot of time on preparing what they are going to teach they look back and they do that background uh, backward planning and they look at what happened and they are going to adjust it. Or they, they might not have been able to help that student at that time, but they're going to post there in order to kind of prepare the next lesson and help the students. Um, so the teacher needs to really be aware of the learning process. You just don't know the language perfectly, but you really need to know how the learning happens, because if you go too fast and the student hasn't understood, it's not gonna work. So I'm going to stop here. Here and we are going to discuss the integration. One second. Where is my screen? Okay. Fanny, can I ask you a question? Of course. Um, I really like the way you've got the color codes for the different sounds, but how do your students? Um, how do you teach vocabulary? How do they comprehend the vocabulary that you've taught them? Okay, that's a good question. So for uh, many of the charts that are written with color, most of the words are actually not vocabulary words. So those are the structural words of the language which is going to help you have the skeleton of the language. And then uh, not many vocabulary words on Hindus. But that doesn't mean that we stop at the charts. So we can point any word on the Fidel, on the ones, uh, the last chart set of charts that I showed you, which has all the possible spelling of the language. So you could possibly point it there. Or even if you 
If you know that your students are ready, you can write it down on the board. You don't need the colors all the time. But how do you introduce the meaning of a vocabulary perhaps different? So um, maybe if that's the other um, meaning. I think yeah. you need to maybe cut your video and just go to voice because you're breaking up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah, I hope it's better. So, yeah, there is yeah. the Fidel where you can point each word uh, using the chart which has all the sounds and spelling. But you can also uh, make different uh, situations. So, I like to use the rods, uh, but we can use uh, pictures, visuals. We can uh, use our imagination. Uh, depends on the level of the students. And we can introduce a word. So, it's really uh, difficult to know how we are going to teach particular vocabulary. It's, it comes because of the situation in, oh, in the context of uh, what the students are interested in uh, working about. Okay. So, for instance, say you want to teach them, est-ce que je peux aller aux toilettes? So, how would you teach that? So, well, I guess that would be because the student needs to go to the toilet. So that would be my first, uh, my first, uh, my first situation is like a surreal need. Yeah. So then they know what we're talking about. And then okay. I can use, uh, uh, I can use the chart, the charts because we have S on the chart. Oh, okay. Um, okay. The charts are the the charts are sounds, right? Or did I miss something? Are the charts sounds? Yeah, so there are different types. The first one has only the colors and sounds. Yeah. Yeah, even you could point anything on this. You point a word because if you were use all these different sounds and you put them together. Right, so no, I totally get that. My, my question is how do the students understand when they put the sounds together, how do they understand what the, what the words mean? That was my question. Well, a word like ESCO would be... That's hard to translate. I would say that it's really about the situation that you're going to, to show, show. Okay. So ESCO will be... It will, it, will, uh, it will be a yes, no question. For sure. So maybe you could give them give different situations. Right. Which has ESCO in order for them to understand that. So maybe if he really needs to go to the toilet, that might not be the right okay. time to go with the lesson asker. But what I mean is really uh, we try to focus on the needs. When a situation arises and there is a need for learning this, then we can do it. But if it's too early, if it's too early, then maybe we can skip it at that time. Because if we are in the first lesson, I don't think it's important for them to learn asker. Okay, so my next question is, um, do you have a pas d'anglais rule in the class or, or, or is it more open? Do you allow English in the class? How does that work? Yeah, that's a good question as well. I, I prefer that it's in French, but I allow English, especially for the beginning. So I don't know, mm -hmm. this is a question that I often have because I would love that everything is immersion, that everything is immersion. But then, mm -hmm. uh, because I'm silent most of the time, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't want silence as you silence as you for me. It's a pedagogical device for me. It's to help them, if if to help yeah. them. But uh, sometimes I speak. And speaking in English is a good way sometimes to understand, to understand, understanding. But I don't use it as a translation. As a translation. Right. Yeah, that's how AIM differs from a lot of programs strict about the pas d'anglais rule in class. And so we, we encourage uh, our students not to speak English ever. But it, is, it, it certainly um, is a challenge as a teacher. Um, so that's wonderful, Fanny. Thank you very much for sharing that. It certainly sounds interesting. What grade levels have been teaching this with? Uh, I have been teaching mostly middle school and uh, the diploma and students, so until grade 12, so until grade 12. But this could work with any oh. age group. Oh, so like from kindergarten all the way to grade 12? I haven't taught in the primary, but it can be used in the primary as well. 
Interesting. Okay. And how popular is the program, Fanny? Do you know how many teachers are using it worldwide? Is there any it's such a figure? Uh, uh, no, it's not so many people. I mean, <laughs> I can tell that I, I know a very small number of people, yeah, but they are very people, active. So I'm yeah, sharing some of the resources I did my is there a community? Uh -huh. Is there a way for people to get involved in an online community so that they can? Yeah, create? there is one which I will add to my slides. It's called Subtle. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other okay. other sites, so they are all there. Yeah, for people to get in touch. And can I ask you a question? Ask you a question. Sure. Um, I want you to know more about the gesture. Gesture. Mm -hmm. Because I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering, I think you mentioned about, uh, mentioned the, for example, the, if you're the, teaching, if you're teaching verbs, or I mean, uh, or, um, so how does it so how does work? It because work? you said, you said irregular, irregular verbs. verbs. Irregular so verbs. a gesture is so going to be a gesture of the verb plus uh, the end of the verb, end, like the terminaison, or the how does it work? How does it work? With verb endings? Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah, this only one slide or one word? Verb endings are uh, off the bat. So we, we use uh, we use the third person singular for the verbs for the first year. So instead of uh, instead of nu and vu, instead of nu we use on, and instead of vu we use tout le monde. So that way we can just stick to the so, je veux, tu veux, il veut, elle veut, on veut, tout le monde veut. So, okay. that's one way we get around to. We don't, we don't look at formal verb endings until the second year of the program. And uh, when it comes to uh, writing, because you said writing, there is writing, so how do you move from gesture so how do you to move from gesture? writing? Is this something you do at the beginning or you wait for some time? Oh, there's, everything is scaffolded. So we start off learning a story or a play. We start off learning it orally, and then we ask and answer questions having to do with the play orally. And then from there, we learn how to read the story. So then we'll read together as a class. And then from there, we get into um, fill-in-the-blank type of questions. And then from there, we get onto something which is called les questions totales which is full sentence answers, but the answer is in, in the question. And then the very last part is called les questions partielles, where they're open-ended questions. But everything is scaffolded and modeled for the students as a class before they, they do it on their own. And the okay. written work is um, always, okay. always based on the play. Okay. And I think it's, it, it sounds very important sounds to very be in this immersion uh, environment, environment this approach, this right? approach, right? So I like that uh, so when you start your class, I'm mean, lucky I mean, like to see your class, so <laughs> I'm just oversharing. But uh, I kind of like that they start the class by seeing, by get inside the classroom. Do you want to share a little more about this? Yeah, well, let me just go back to my presentation now because I do talk about that a little bit. So let me just go into, oh, let me just share my screen first of all. Share. Okay, so music. Um, can you see my screen, Fanny? It's doing really weird things, but can you see my screen? Yes. Yeah. Music is a huge part of the AIM program, and I. I love to sing songs with my students as well, but we start off every class with a song. And uh, the AIM program comes with songs, but I've created PowerPoints that go with all the songs, and I've created PowerPoints for songs even outside of the AIM programs. So we start every class off with a song. It gets the students in the mood for speaking in French, and it teaches them important vocabulary and relevant vocabulary. Um, I have put all the PowerPoints on to Google Slides, so there's a link there. If, uh, if you're interested, any teachers who are watching, click on that link. Again, my presentation is the bottom left-hand corner, bit.ly slash FSL Tech Sill, case sensitive. Um, but you're welcome to download all those slides. You, you do need to purchase the music separately, so on each 
slideshow to say who the artist is. So you do have to go online and, and purchase the CD separately. Some artists, you can uh, purchase the digital files. Um, I also have a YouTube playlist with all of these songs that I've created videos for, so check that out as well. So Fanny, I'm just going to move right ahead with my presentation and talk about how I integrate technology in my program. Is that okay? Yeah, that's perfect. Go for it. Okay. So I have to say that um, I want to talk about Seesaw, and I know Fanny, you're familiar with Seesaw as well. I started using Seesaw this year. And it has met so many of my needs in so many different ways. Um, but in terms of technology, Seesaw is wonderful because my students create lots of projects with technology. And I was always struggling for a place that they can put these projects to share with each other, to share with me, and to share with their parents, and to share with people outside our, our school and other classes and other students. So Seesaw answered all these needs. Um, the, there's a free version, there's an edgy version, I'm just using the, the free version. But to teachers out there, if you're listening, I really encourage you to check out Seesaw. Um, here's a little bit more about Seesaw. Um, and there is a tutorial there that I created if you want to get started. And the last link is click here to see my class blog. So I have uh, two grade four classes, they've been using Seesaw a lot. If you click on that link, you'll see there is a password to view the blogs, but go ahead and take a look at those when you get a chance, and you'll see the type of technology projects that my students have been working on. Moving on to Web 2.0 Tools, one of our favorite tools for creating wraps with is an online site called Incredibox. So there's a link here to click to the website, and then I have created a uh, tutorial also on how to use Screencastify. Because in Credit Box, your students can create beatbox rhythms, but then they also create raps en français. Then they can record their raps with the beatbox rhythm in the background, and they do that with Screencastify. So my students are obsessed with in Credit Box, and they love creating raps with in Credit Box. The other tool that is wonderful online and is free is called Flip Snack. So there's a link to the website, and there's also an example there. And basically with Flip Snack, your students will create stories on a Google Doc. They need to save it as a PDF file. And then they just upload that PDF to the Flip Snack site, which creates a flip book. Um, now, if you combine that with Screencastify, they can also record their voice as they flip through the book. So Screencastify, if you're not aware, is a Chrome extension. And it allows you to do a screencast of your, of your entire screen. The next tool that we love, and I've just recently discovered this one, but we can't get enough of it, is called Adobe Spark Video. So there's an example you can click on to see something that one of my students created. There's also a tutorial that I created. It's probably, hands down, the easiest way to create uh, a slideshow with a video component. So there's music that you can choose from. You can upload your voice separately on each screen, on each slide. There's different themes that you can choose from, and you can switch the theme midway through your project. Everything is saved online in the cloud, so you don't have to worry about your students um, losing their file, or they can start the they can start their work at school and they can finish it off at home and vice versa. It is awesome. There's also a Google login option, which my students use. And then G Suite tools, the tools we use, it's a lot. Uh, so we can create choose your own adventure with Google Slides. That's by creating links on the slides. So again, you can click there for an example. And there's another link there for a tutorial. Um, I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't actually done this with my students, but um, I plan to. It's just that something we haven't got around to doing, but I know that teachers have used it in the past and have had a lot of success with it. Fanny, I'm hearing your audio. Is there any way you could turn that off? Thank you. All right, so this is something we do use a lot, digital stories with Google Slides and we video. So my students will create stories on Google Slides, they will do a screenshot 
of each slide. Then they will upload these screenshots to WeVideo where they can add their voice and they can add music as well. So WeVideo is a free online site where you can edit video. And again, they have lots of options for music. Um, there is an edgy version as well. If your students are going to be using this a lot, I do recommend the edgy version. It costs about $4 per student for the entire year. And with like 30 hours of time, which is humongous, um, it's very inexpensive. And our school bought in because our students use WeVideo all the time. So again, there's an example of the type of story that you can create. And there's a tutorial. Google Albums and Flipbooks, there's lots of great templates online for Google Albums and Flipbooks. And it's, again, it's just a matter of taking the template and inserting your own pictures, inserting your own text. So click there for some templates. Um, and then again, with Screencastify, your students can create a video uh, as they flip through the slides and record their voice. I have an example of a cat video. If you I want to get your students creating uh, video cards, maybe for Mother's Day or for uh, parents' birthdays or, or Christmas, whatever the case may be. Uh, basically, it's a Google slide that you can add your text to, and then you can go to YouTube and find a funny YouTube video and insert it in the middle, and it creates a digital video card. Google Drawings is something my students use a lot, and I have a friend. Um, who, uh, her name is Karen Smith, and her students created some beautiful French posters using Google Drawings. So I encourage you to take a look at those examples. Uh, Eric Kurtz is a Google superstar on Twitter who created this amazing template for building your own snowman, and I, I made a French version of it where students can create their own snowman in Google Slides, and then the idea is to have them write a description of it as well. And on Seesaw, they can do a screenshot of the slide, and upload to Seesaw, and record their voice reading the slide out loud. I use Google Forms a lot for mini quizzes. Um, the new Google Forms has a quiz feature built into it, and I've been using that. I used to use Fluvaroo. But I find that as an easy get a mark at the end, and I like it because once you is on, you have the option. Your students can see their result right away, um, and they always love seeing their result at the end. So you can click on those links to see an example and a tutorial as well. Uh, we do lots of work on iPads. We have a class of iPads in my class. I'm really fortunate to have iPads. We also have Chromebooks. But the apps that we love creating projects with are Yak It Kids. And there's an example that a student has created. Um, and there's a tutorial as well. But Yak It Kids is, you will find images online, um, eyes, and you can add mouth, make them talk. And they talk in funny voices, high and low voices. And my students will create, the Yaki Kids has only 15 seconds to create a video, but uh, I get my students to save the video onto their camera roll. And then if to, what they do is they then will do a, a number of these videos to make a longer video. Then they open up iMovie and import the videos into iMovie, and then they can add music as well to make longer videos. Telegami, I, I have not used this with my students, but I hope to eventually. But Telegami, most people are aware of Telegami by now. It's a wonderful app that you can create your own avatar and um, record your voice. Uh, you can upload your own images as backgrounds as well. And similar to what we did with Yak at Kids, my students, I, I would encourage once my students, if we start this project, I would encourage them to make longer videos by um, creating short videos, then saving the video onto the camera roll, importing a number of them into iMovie to make longer videos. Sock puppets we absolutely adore. I create many, many videos with sock puppets. I give them a dialogue or they can create their own dialogue. I like 
them to, I encourage them to work with a partner. So they bring two sock puppets up and they can ask each other questions and it's just a riot. They actually look like sock puppets. Um, and again, they piece different scenes together into iMovie to make longer, longer videos. Haiku Deck is an absolutely gorgeous app to create presentations with and I've had my students create Mother's Day videos with it and the way they do that is by creating their slide deck in Haiku Deck. Haiku Deck is, has gorgeous photos that are done by professional photographers um, but once st the students have created their slide deck so the topic would be Maman, je t'aime parce que, so mom, I love you because, and they would do five or six different reasons why they love their mom. They would do a screenshot of each slide and then import those screenshots into iMovie where they would record their voice speaking the slides out loud and add music and then save on, on YouTube or upload to Seesaw. Papa Pals also is a very popular app with my students. We will take a play that we're working on, one of the AIM plays, and reenact it with, uh, with Puppet Pals. They can import their own images from, from the camera roll um, and create, create stories using, to get my students to change the words in the play to their own words to personalize the stories a bit. We have used uh, Mystery Hangouts to do hangouts with other classes and pre previously at the beginning of the video that I showed uh, where the object is to guess the location of a mystery class before they guess our location. We do it in French so it gives good vocabulary for learning uh, geographical terms and um, the students have so much fun with it. Uh, there's a video there showing us doing some mystery hangouts. We also love using Google Hangouts just for inviting guests into the classroom and asking guests questions. We had Wendy Maxwell in, and we asked her questions, the students thought of questions beforehand, and we had John Dino in, an artist, a musical artist, a rap artist that they love to, to sing with. So take a look at those videos and lots of resources there for you to check out as well if you're interested on in learning how to get started. We have pledged to a breakout edu en français, which they absolutely adore. So go ahead and take a look at those links. There is a game there that you can play with your students, it's pre-made. Um, so have fun with that. I just want to close by saying this is an amazing website called La Où Je Dors, and my friend Larissa Araj pointed me out to this. But there's lots of authentic material there. Where French students from around the world with different backgrounds, different cultures, different accents talk about their bedrooms. Um, so please take a look at that. And now a post is by my friend Larissa. Um, and that is the end of my presentation. Thank please you, contact me. Yeah. yeah, you're welcome. Uh, yeah, I think uh, yeah, many yeah, of the tools we yeah, already tools have in my school, we have in my school. And some we don't because uh, we don't because uh, French in the, in the oh, we have French in primary. I don't know. I haven't had the experience of teaching French in primary. So more um, more resources for middle school. For middle school. Um, just gonna quickly um, just share, my screen. share my screen. And, and show you that, show you that slide. Slide. I have put this um, I have link this, over uh, here, link over here, which is you to a post on my website, which explains on my website. website. You can use the following tools. You can use the following tools. In the classroom. In the classroom. So I'm not going to describe so them. I'm not going to many of them are similar to what you talked about. So, uh, especially the G Suite, uh, so, and the Mystery Skype, we do Mystery Skype because it's uh, easier with our connection than Hangouts. It's similar about when you talked about rap, it's using, rap, it's using rap. Um, um, and a lot of tools for collaboration and creativity and video making and making children's voice. So, all the so things here, I'll explain on my side. 
So what, what, I, did is, what I did is um, I put the um, links of both our presentations under under the under this video, so in the description. So in the description, so it should be easy for you guys to find it. Easy for you guys to find it. And if and if, okay. Before I leave you, I want to tell you that I got this book from Sylvia, and this is the book every educator should have. Every educator should have. So I just uh, lent it to Thank one of my colleagues. Uh, lent it to one of my colleagues, and she left a nice card for me here. Nice Thank you, Carla, for watching. <laughs> but this is great, so you can find it on Amazon. I got Sylvia. I got Sylvia. Yeah. For sure. You can find a link to buy it on my website, sylviaduckworth.com. Great. So I'm really glad that we could do this because it was challenging with the time difference, but we did it. <laughs> so um, thank you so much again, Sylvia, for coming and sharing all those things. Sharing all those things. Thank and you for having me, Fanny. I'm sure that people who are going to watch the recording are also going to benefit because all the slides are down there. Exactly. Okay, so thank you so much, and maybe we'll do this again. Okay, Fanny, merci beaucoup. Merci, à bientôt. Bonne journée. Bonne journée. Ciao.